The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Good morning and welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. I'm Shannon Penrod and I'm here with the fabulous and wonderful Dr. Doreen Grampiche. As you can see, we're not in the same room together today, but we're here together nonetheless. Uh, Dr. Grampiche, good morning. Good morning, Shannon, and good morning, everyone. Good to be here. We're thrilled to have you. Uh, and do you want to tell people where you are and why you are, where you are? <laughs> yeah, I'm in actually in New York City. Um, I had uh, did a show this morning for uh, New York Today, and then right after that, another one for a, a news channel in Atlanta. So it's been a busy morning. You are killing it. You're getting it done <laughs> uh, and spreading the word. So thrilled that all of you are joining us here with Dr. Grampy Shea this morning. If you don't know her, she is a true expert in the field of autism. She's been working in this field for more than 40 years. Are, are we really saying 45 now? Is that really, or did I dream that? No, we're saying 45. We're saying 45 years now. Uh, a true expert in the field of autism, and uh, she's worked with literally everyone. Uh, <laughs> On the spectrum from very young babies up through senior citizens and includes the family members and the loved ones of those individuals on the spectrum because I I just always enjoy getting to spend time with you because you take a very human approach to everything that you do and looking at individuals as individuals and their individual needs and what is important and useful to them in their lives I am going to get t-shirts made that Dr. My, my favorite phrase, and that's saying a lot because Dr. Grampy Shea says a lot that I love, but my favorite thing that she says all the time is it has to be fair, which I think is a great guideline for anything in life, but especially for treating and loving and helping and assisting someone who is on the autism spectrum. It has to be fair. Uh, and in order to be fair, it has to be individualist. So uh, we're thrilled that Dr. Grampy Shea is here with us. She's going to be answering your questions for the next hour live. You can be writing in right now live. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and a dozen other places that are fabulous. Traven will show you in a few minutes. Um, but you absolutely can be writing in, and I will be able to see your comments in real time. It just logged me out, but we're going to log back in, and then it's all going to be good. Uh, and then I will be able to see them. Uh, I do want to say, too, that all of our shows that we've been doing, we're now in our 13th year of doing Ask Dr. Doreen. This show is officially a teenager, so, <laughs> which, you know, stop and think about what that's going to be like. But uh, I want to say to you that the shows are archived. We are on YouTube, and you can go back and look at the shows. You can also search... The, by question to see if Dr. Doreen has already answered a question that's similar to what you want to ask, or you can ask your question because we love getting your questions and your comments. Uh, we do have a topic that we start with every day and that we're here, and our topic right now is developing focus skills because so many people have written in so many questions about that. So our starter question here, Dr. Doreen, is my child has struggled with being able to sit and attend during preschool. How should we be working on this over the summer to help him to be able to do this in kindergarten in the fall? Well, that's a great question. I love it. And there's so many aspects to improving focus. So let's try to touch all of them and then make sure that we're also answering this specific question. But really, um, I think kids have problems with attending and focus for lots of different reasons. Um, so it's important to kind of go through and make sure that we're addressing each of the possible reasons, right? So number one, as I always say, Shannon, the most important thing is to make sure a child is sleeping uh, well, because if a child is not sleeping, you're, it's just too much to ask for them to you know, have to attend during the day. They're just going to be kind of a little bit out of it, tired, you know? So sleep is always a very important factor. 
Um, and then, of course, we want to make sure that uh, the child's health in general uh, has every element that's going to help the child. For instance, if you give a child uh, food that has a lot of sugar in it, it's going to be very hard for that child to stay focused and sit calmly because they're just going to be on a sugar rush. Um, they're going to be active, their mind is going to be running, they're going to be physically running around, they're not going to be able to sit. And so that's another thing, is make sure your child's diet is one that is not promoting hyperactivity. So sleep, diet, both of those are very important. And then I think it's a matter of changing the environment or antecedents in the environment to try to help the child. So for example, if a child is having a hard time paying attention, why don't we ask the teacher to put the child in the front of the class, perhaps where it's easier for the child to attend? Uh, why don't we make sure the child is not close to other stimuli, in the, like looking outside of a window or sitting someplace where there's a lot of other children who are making a lot of noise. So let's make sure all the environment is set up in a way that helps the child stay focused. And then again, Shannon, like everything else in, in behavioral psychology, reinforce, reinforce, reinforce. So you know, if the child is able to stay focused for two minutes, great. Let's give the child a token or a reward or just have a shadow uh, assistant or teacher there saying, good job, that's really nice. And some form of maybe other activity and then come back and shape the child's ability to sit there for longer and longer periods of time. So we always want to start with what the child is capable of, reward it continuously, and gradually increase it. Also, I want to say I hear an echo as I'm talking. I don't know if our viewers are hearing that as well or if, if the sound is okay. Yes, if, if there's any possibility that you can turn your computer volume down a little bit, what you're hearing me on, because it's picking up you, we think. Dr. Grant Pichet. Sure, I just turned it down. Okay, and I'm not hearing the echo anymore, so I think we're good. Uh, Great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, and I love this because I think a lot of times when we're talking about focus, as a parent, we think of what we want to see in the end, which is that at some point our child will be able to sit for, you know, and watch an entire movie and not need to get up or do anything, right? Or to right. be able to sit and attend a lecture in college and not to be, not have to get up and do anything. And, and I see this even at schools sometimes that the, the focus becomes on the end goal, not charting the course to get there. I remember once a parent, I mean, I shouldn't laugh. This is horrible. A parent came to me with an IEP and it was for a kindergartner. And the goal was that he could sit for an hour in circle time without having any help or support for an hour. And I said, I don't know a neurotypical kid who could sit someplace for an hour unless it's the most exciting, unless you bring in the Paw Patrol and they're right. there in person. Like right. that's just, like we have to have realistic expectations. But, I, but I, I think it's hard for us to realize that we have to be able to start with, as you were saying, a smaller amount of time and reinforce that and have the trust and belief that like pizza dough that we can stretch that out to longer. I don't think that as parents, we necessarily know that. So I love hearing right. you say that. I think that that's a really important point. And Shannon, think about it. If you actually have a child who's sitting there for an hour, they're probably tuning out part of that period of time and also getting bored. Right. I mean, like any of us sitting there for an hour might have a hard time with that. So I, I think that it, the summer, it's a great opportunity to start practicing this. And, you know, if you're practicing it at home, you want to make sure that you are uh, able to kind of mimic a classroom situation because in at home, it might be possible for the child to stay calm and pay attention. But in school, remember, 
there's lots of noise around there's lots of other kids uh, the child is at a distance from the teacher and um, there's all these different factors so if you really want to practice staying involved with a topic for a longer period of time you have to gradually shape it up there we go uh and, and i want to say too that somebody else had written in another question about focus saying my 12 year old is really struggling with focus i don't know how to work on this are meds the only avenue but i think that you just answered that for us that there are so many different ways to work on it and getting started wherever you are and trying to build out that focus but I know that you might want to say something about meds as well for exactly. a 12-year-old. Exactly. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I'm actually glad that the parent brought that up because, you know, when you have cases where the child, like, really does have ADHD, uh, medication can be very, very helpful. I've had a lot of children benefit from a variety of different medications for ADHD. You know, typically... Uh, we use stimulants when you have a child with hyperactivity, but now there's also serotonin, uh, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, uh, like Stratera, which work on attention and focus, and they help as well. So I'm, I am in support of doing whatever it helps, you know, whatever it takes to help the child uh, focus because the more they are able to focus, the more they're learning, the more they're part of what's going on in their environment. There we go. And, and I, I'm trying to focus on what you're saying, but I'm just noticing how great you look. Like oh. you, you look so, like, aren't, isn't this her color palette? The walls and the curtains behind you and the a jacket, you look fabulous. So that's Thank me, you. my focus going someplace else. There we go. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that Autism Journey with Elijah said, hello, good morning. Elijah graduated kindergarten today. Yay. That's awesome. Congratulations. And I saw pictures on Facebook this morning, and I don't know if they were pictures of him getting ready to go or just pictures from before, but what a cutie patootie. Oh my gosh, he is just one of those luscious children that you just want to pick him up and hug them and squeeze them. Uh, wouldn't because I'm a stranger, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, and Parker has written in, he's got a question here, but first he wrote in and said for the, the parent whose child was struggling to sit and attend during uh, preschool, uh, his advice to the parent is to hold your child back. What do you think about that, Dr. Graham Pichet? You know, I don't know that holding a child back on its own is beneficial. I think uh, if you want to hold a child back because you have, for instance, intensive ABA going on in the home and you just want one more year to be able to help the child catch up, then certainly that's okay depending on the child's abilities. I hesitate uh, a lot of times because I don't want uh, the child to get bored either. But certainly there are moments in time when a child is really not able to keep up. And also they're kind of already, you know, on the younger side, so it doesn't harm them to hold the child back. It really is kind of a, a, one of those decisions you have to make on an individual basis. There we go. Uh, Parker has written in with a question that has to do with focus. He says, funeral etiquette. I have a visitation to go to in a few hours and a funeral tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It is a military funeral. A church friend lost his battle with Parkinson's last Wednesday. It'll be a military funeral with gunfire and gunfire scares me and I cannot focus for the life of me during solemn times. Please help me. Yeah, I mean, Parker, I think the fact that you're sort of aware of what is coming is a, is a great thing because you can prepare yourself. Uh, uh, you know, if you're having a hard time with the sound, uh, you, there are lots of visual elements that will cue you as to when the gunfire is about to happen. And perhaps you can take some earbuds that go in your ear and you can actually either just have uh, white noise, which will help you prevent you from hearing the gunfire that loudly, or you can even have like meditation music in the background that will help you calm down as well. Uh, if it's a matter of, you know, just being able to focus during the entire funeral, then I really suggest that you might want to uh, help yourself by having, for instance, something on your phone 
that you can look down on. A lot of times people are able to focus better when they have what's called divided attention. So you look at your phone and then you'll have another session where you're focusing on the funeral. Um, it is okay if you're not listening to every word that people are saying, you know, in the funeral procession. That's totally okay. I don't think any of us uh, really pay that much attention when we're at a funeral, but it is important to stay calm. I think that's a social behavior that is uh, expected at a funeral is to like stay calm and look at the procession and what's going on. Yeah, I. It's interesting because we talked about this a little bit last week with with Parker about you know when it's about you and when it's not about you, and and I have to say my mom was the best that I remember being a teenager and one of the dads in our neighborhood died, and mm -hmm. I was terrified. I because we were going to go and. Um, there was going to be an open casket. We were going to go to the wake, and I didn't know how to behave at that. I was probably 14, 15 years old, and I remember my mother saying to me very clearly, look, when, when it's something like this, a solemn thing, when, when people are mourning, you, you really only have two jobs, mm -hmm. and your job is to physically be there, right, to physically show up yeah. because that makes the person feel comfort that this many people cared, right, and then at some point, if there's an opportunity, um, you know, like there might be a line or something, she said, you don't have to look at the casket, you can walk right by the casket, but your job there is to let the person who, you know, that's the family member that you're, you're or the, the friend that you're there to support, to let them know that you're there. And that yeah. means literally standing in front of them, sometimes holding their hand and just saying, I'm here that you yes. don't have to have perfect words because there are no words. And that that helped me, Parker, as a teenager to go, oh, I don't have to solve everybody's grief. I don't have to fix anything. I don't have to do anything other than just, my job is to physically be here. And if I can, when I walk through the procession, squeeze somebody's hand and say, I'm here. Yeah. And that's it. And right. for, for me, that was very soothing because it's a lot sensory at these yeah. things. It's a lot. Between the smell of flowers and sometimes there's, you know, depending on where you are, like the gunpowder, all of those things, the gunfire. Um, but, I, but I love having the headphones in because it's not your job to listen. It's not your job to remember everything that they said during the, the thing. It's, you know, nobody's going to quiz you afterwards. Um, right. But I love that you're going, Parker, because that's you supporting your community. What a yeah. wonderful, wonderful thing. Did you want to add anything to that, Dr. Grant? Well, Parker just also wrote that, you know, he really wants to set a good example for oh. the individual's grandson. And I think, Shannon, you just answered that, basically. If you were there, Parker, I think that is all you need to do. And that is already setting a good example. You know, funerals are just, you're not, you don't have to do anything. It's a matter of just being there is a sign of respect. And that's important. Yes, absolutely. Um, Brian, we're saying good morning to you. And we're saying good morning to Carolina and Sarah. Sarah, what a pleasure to have you here. Uh, and Susie, good morning. Uh, I want to go to Carolina's question. She says, my son is 18 and chose not to finish high school because he thinks he's not smart enough and can't mm -hmm. take it anymore. He just got diagnosed with ASD, but already got diagnosed with ADHD at 12. Mom continues to encourage him to finish, but hoping you have more tips. Thank you for your time, doctor. Yeah, oh my gosh, that's a tough one. So first of all, I really, really encourage you to continue, um, I guess, prompting him to finish and helping him in any way you can. Obviously, there are other ways that you can get your high school diploma without actually going to school. Uh, th there are ways you can do it online now. Uh, you can do homeschooling. Uh, you can help him prepare and just take the GED exam. Um, I think it is very important for him, so I support your efforts to try to get him to do this. The bigger issue is that with ADHD and ASD, um, it's hard for him. 
And so I guess I have to ask, are you doing everything to help him? Is he on medication if he needs to be? Uh, is he receiving tutoring and or ADA? Um, are you able to like make the work easier for him? So in a way that helps him actually accomplish it. Are there other things that he is successful at so that he starts to gain more confidence in himself? Uh, these are all things that would help uh, turn the situation around. A lot of times our kids just give up because they don't want to be exposed to situations where they will fail again. So I think it's important that you know you help him, hold his hand through it, um, and give him self-confidence by bringing into his life other things that he's good at, and then he might be more open to it at that point. Yeah, I love that Parker wrote in and said, uh, my sister did her G GED and is successful and has a associate and um, dental assisting and high school is not for everyone. Yeah. And, and I, I appreciate what you said, Dr. Grampiche, that there's lots of different ways to do it. And it's not just going and doing what he was doing before or doing GED. I, I want to remind you that even he has not graduated yet. He is 18 years old. I personally would encourage you to go back to the school with the diagnosis and say that you would now, now like to have not only an IEP, but an ITP. Yeah. They're going to freak out. And for those of you who don't know what the ITP is, that's the individual, individual transition plan. And, that's, and it gets attached to the IEP, and it's a plan for dealing with, you know, what is he going to do when he is finished with school? And uh, where is he going to live? Who's going to be his support? And they should be changing whatever the curriculum is to fit him. Yeah. So uh, there, are, there are all different kinds of ways of finishing high school, too. And they might have a program. At this point, it's an unknown, right? You don't know what they have. But I really want to encourage you, go back to the school. And, and even I would you know, say, even before you like have a discussion with him, go have a discussion with the school. Because the fact that he says he doesn't feel that he's smart enough Mm -hmm. uh, it tells me that the school was not handling things properly and correctly. Um, and I'm, I'm real fussy about that. And they have a legal responsibility to, even though he's 18, because he has not graduated yet. So yeah. go back, um, have a meeting with them and say, here's the diagnosis and what, what do you recommend moving forward? You don't have to take what they recommend, but ask them what they have. Here in Los Angeles, we have wonderful programs that students can go to from the time that they're 18 to 21, where they can be learning all different kinds of trades. It's a, it's a really exciting thing to do. And it doesn't mean that you can't then eventually graduate. Um, you know, they have uh, completion uh, mm -hmm. documents that they have, but they also have where you can graduate with a high school fully credited diploma. So I encourage you to go back to the school. Yeah. And I just want to say, Shannon, just to add on to that, so, you know, I would recommend that as well, depending on what the issue is. Sometimes it's not a matter of, of accommodation. It's more that our kids have a very hard time with other kids. Yeah. Um, there could, it could be an issue of bullying, for instance. Yeah. Um, and or social anxiety. So really, you kind of need to figure out like what is the cause of this and then assist him with whatever is necessary uh, to succeed. Yes, and I didn't mean to disavow that. My point is that whatever it is he does need to succeed, the school yes. should still be funding it. Yes. Even if it oh, isn't, absolutely. even if, it, if, if he's not with his peers or he is with his peers, they should right. be funding it. So I would go back and bring that to their table and say, how are you going to help me? And, and yeah, uh, I think we're saying the same thing here. Yes. Brian has written in and said, update, our son is about to start grade one in August. We made a right. case to the school that he is neurodivergent and needs an advanced learning room at his Montessori school. Um, they there's a, a room i don't i don't want to i don't know what <laughs> what's personal but there's a room in room that's best for highly academic but it will be far less calming room he told us many times kinder was boring 
Mm. Um, but the softer setting did great things for him socially. We cannot hold him back when he's thriving and craving new, new questions, questions. His focus item is still a problem. We pray he will improve that. It is a catch-22 of social versus academic versus calming versus high achiever potential. It will be a Montessori grade one through three room. We're both excited about further growth, but fearful he will not be able to cope with the transition. And, and this mm -hmm. is the child that we've talked about before that focusing um, is a big, focusing is the big issue, but uh, the fact that he's saying that he's bored, what do you want to say about all that, Dr. Green? This is awesome. First of all, Brian, this is awesome. Like, congratulations, and I'm excited for him, actually. I, I understand where you're coming from because I, I've had a lot of kids at this type of uh, issue, right? Um, and I always, what I've learned over the years is that, like, I you should really encourage forward movement for kids that are saying they get bored because that boredom factor is a big deal. If the child gets kind of stuck in an environment for a long period of time where they're not really challenged or in, given anything interesting, um, they'll start to like occupy themselves with other things and then it becomes very hard to bring them back. So. I would really recommend that you go forward, but you use the summer to focus on exactly what the issue is. So that means, uh, you know, expose him to more and more distracting, noisy, perhaps situations and teach him how to deal with it. Uh, you can certainly start doing like things that he's good at, for instance, but go to a noisier place or maybe uh, record sounds from a classroom and put them in the background. Like start acclimating him and ask him questions when there is a noisy type of thing, like help him to start paying attention, help him to increase his ability to pay attention even when there's noise in the background. Reward that, um, like really give him the opportunity over the summer to practice that. A lot of times social behavior with other kids will also improve because the other kids might also be smart like him and, uh, you know, he'll find his, his group, his uh, niche, and that's really important. I love that Brian says, I will say we took grand steps to soak in the vibes about uh, room options via, via via volunteer time. So I think what that means, Brian, is that you guys went in and volunteered so you could soak up the vibes. Uh, and he says, OMG, we had a for, uh, we had a forward selling the principal meet and powerful email follow-up. I love right. that because, you know, they'll tell you everything that's going on in the classroom and you don't know, right? But if you volunteer, then all of a sudden you have eyes on the situation. You will learn more in one hour volunteering at your child's school than you will at every IEP meeting with what the people tell you. Yeah. It's a yeah. good use of your time. I love that. And but he also, also like, I think Shannon, it, it's also like, I love, you know, parents that are, who are writing in t today and like, they're so prepared and wanting to use the summer months to kind of prep their child, which I think is beautiful. Um, you know, and I'm sure he'll be able to succeed and handle it, but just in case, give him some tools that he can use if it is in fact too noisy or too chaotic for him for instance make sure that you're communicating with the teacher and like give him the ability to go up to the teacher and say i need a break he can always uh, go to the bathroom perhaps to calm down he can always ask to go to the hallway for a few minutes like there's things our kids can do that will help them stay regulated if it's too chaotic of an environment. There we go. And he says that they have him lined up uh, for two weeks of a STEM camp this summer. And he says, thank you. I value your advice. That's uh, great. Thank you so much, Brian. And Parker, I didn't know, Parker, that you were doing computer repair. That's amazing. I'm so excited. I wish you lived closer. Uh, <laughs> we could always have use somebody on retainer. Uh, Okay, uh, uh, Lucy has written in and said, wait, you know, strap in, Dr. Grampuche, because I'm going to light my hair on fire right now. Um, the school district did an FBA for a five-year-old son with ASD because I requested a one-on-one -on -one aid to help him focus. 
When asked about the status of the data collected and the report results, the response was that they did not collect data mm -hmm. since child did not have challenging behaviors. Does the FBA include more than challenging behaviors? My son needs help with redirecting, uh, priming, help with engagement, data taken on how many questions they ask or manding he does or doesn't do. What is the typical timeline for an FBA? What can I do to state my case to get him the support he needs? That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. There's a lot of really good information there. Yeah. So first of all, FBA is a functional behavior assessment. Generally, it is done to uh, understand more about why a challenging behavior is occurring. An FBA is supposed to be looking at what are the circumstances around challenging behavior. So for example, what's happening right before and what's happening right after. Now, not paying attention could also be classified as a challenging behavior and you could be doing an FBA on just not paying attention. Like what is happening that when he's not paying attention, what happens before it and what happens after it? Sometimes there's a reinforcer afterwards that's maintaining the child's kind of lack of focus. Or sometimes, as I said earlier, there's an antecedent that's contributing to it. For instance, the classroom is too noisy or the child is sitting far from the teacher, whatever it might be. Um, there is no excuse for them to say there's no data. If there's no data, an FBA was not conducted. It has nothing at all to do with whether or not a challenging behavior at that moment occurred. That's just nonsense. They need to help you with all these other things that you mentioned um, engagement, for instance, they could have taken data on the amount of time that he is attending to the teacher versus not being engaged, and therefore then they would have a plan on how to improve and increase his period of time that, of engagement. So not unlike this, and even all that is aside, it doesn't even, you know, if they did an FBA, and I don't know how long it was, but they didn't observe challenging behavior, so what? Let's move on. There's a million things that need to be taught to our kids to help them improve and do better. So, you know, let me ask you, you mentioned some stuff about like he, uh, they, he's not manning or he's not doing various other things that would be important. So whoever was doing the uh, FBA should be more focused on teaching um, skills and not just dealing with challenging behaviors. So I think that's really important. I, I, I'm, I guess I'm gobsmacked. Can, is it really possible that somebody could say, I went in to do an FBA because you have to be, you have to have an idea of what you're looking for when you go in to do an FBA, right? Yeah. And that they really came back and said that there was no challenging behavior, I guess, like, what? I, like, it doesn't we, even make sense to me. Well, that's the problem, Shannon. I think that a lot of behaviorists only deal with challenging behavior. They think that you know, what their role is, is to reduce challenging tantrums or aggression or stuff like that. What they don't realize is that ABA has two sides. One side is to reduce those frustrating, be those behaviors that have come about as a result of frustration um, and as a result of not being able to communicate. But the other side is to teach skills. And one without the other just doesn't work. Even if they were to observe a challenging behavior, the way to eliminate those challenging behaviors is to teach better communication so the child can communicate better instead of the challenging behavior. In either case, it doesn't matter. The parent is saying this child has other issues going on and that BCBA should be focusing on what are the things I need to teach this child. Um, and so there's lots of other evaluations that they should be doing other than just an FBA to observe challenging behavior. 
Yeah, I, this goes right hand in hand with a uh, text that I got this morning. Somebody wrote in about uh, their child's IEP and they said, my question is, is it okay that they mention aggressive behavior in his IEP? I just don't want that to follow him around forever if it's going to be an issue. He really is not an aggressive child, um, but if you make him mad, then he may throw a tantrum and during that time he may kick or scratch. And this is for a child that I believe is in, in kindergarten or going into yeah. kindergarten. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't, I, I don't want you to worry about a behavior being attached to your child. Although certainly, you know, it's not so much that it, if it's in an IEP, it doesn't concern me. I mean, that's actually part of their job is to help identify what is causing the frustration enough to evoke aggression, right? We want to deal with the aggression. You wrote, when he gets mad, he will aggress. Okay, he has to learn not to do that. And so it's important that they actually do a, a intervention for that. And it starts by going into an IEP, obviously. So that is important. Don't worry about that. I uh, certainly have had circumstances where it's not the IEP, but it's teachers who gossip with each other and say, oh, this child is aggressive. And then the next teacher and the next teacher will always have that kind of label on the child. But I don't really see that happening when it's a kindergartner. Usually that kind of thing happens when the child has been aggressive for many, many years and is now maybe you know, out of control as a teenager and everybody's kind of afraid. Uh, when it's just the beginning, it's a good thing that they're actually writing it in the IEP because by the time your child's in first grade, you don't want there to be any kind of aggression left because, you know, then that'll follow him. So I think it's actually a good thing that they're dealing with it. Hopefully yeah. they're dealing with it the right way. Yeah, absolutely. I can tell you guys as a former teacher how much gets discussed. Yeah. And it would make me crazy um, that I would get a student that somebody would already have forewarned me uh, was a difficult student. Now, and I want you to know that there are lots of teachers that are out there that are good teachers that, honestly, those kids used to excite me more than anybody else. Um, because those were the kids that if you use some of the techniques that Dr. Grand Pichet is talking about, those kids would fly. And, and, I, and I will tell you one of the best things that you can do as a parent to combat this if you feel like your child has been talked about by teachers is that volunteering piece. Mm -hmm. If you are there on campus and volunteering, and sometimes you can't get the volunteer job in the classroom. I've talked about this before that sometimes they send you to the copy room. Oh, take that job. You'll eventually work your way into the classroom, but you will find that everybody will look at you and your child different and be more open to looking at strategies to help your child if you are seen as somebody who's willing to help the school. I have seen that time and time again and I have experienced that where I got labeled the difficult mom who was always difficult. I volunteered and then I was everyone's friend and that's important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, lo I love Brian reminding us that. Hey Becky, first Be Becky has two things. She says, hello doctor, what's your take on broccoli sprout supplement? for an almost five-year-old on the spectrum, but then she further wants to know, how do I help my child feed himself? So I know nothing about broccoli sprout supplements. Do you, Shannon? I've not yes. really heard that. Well, I mean, it was a really popular thing a couple of years ago, and now it has died down a little bit, but there's, I'm, I'm not gonna remember what the actual chemical compound, there was a study that came out um, that uh, is it sulf sulfurophane or something like that, that you've, we've all noticed the phenomenon that sometimes when kids on the spectrum get a high fever, mm -hmm. that suddenly their pathway gets a little clearer and they can speak more when they have a fever than when they can't. Yeah. And, and they were saying that this is because there's a certain chemical compound and that it exists in broccoli sprouts. There's so yeah. many schools of thought on this, though, that you would have to eat so much broccoli sprouts that it would mess up your digestive system. Um, but they've now put it into pills. I would be very cautious about, because most of them that are out there uh, are not organic. And mm -hmm. I think putting that much green matter that isn't organic into your child's system can cause other issues with focus. 
So, uh, you know, I, I have not yet, if, if I had found a good company that did this organically, that was sustainable, because uh, mm -hmm. they've come and gone, I would have had them here on the show. Uh, yeah. But I have not yet. So that's my take on it. But now that probably reminded you of the study because um, you probably weren't thinking of it as broccoli sprouts. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, I just, I guess the only thing I want to add is that I, you know, it's looking, I, I look at myself and I'm one of those people that uh, over time keeps adding supplements to my own diet, right? And I have probably, I take some, somewhere around 20 supplements every morning, right? And I don't, it, it, and I know a lot of kids who went or are going through or have or continue to struggle with that because we've added one more and one more and one more and after time it becomes like all these supplements. What I really do recommend to parents is to talk to and meet with an experienced nutritionist or dietitian who can help you really figure out what is needed um, you know, I'll tell, I'll give you an example, just myself, I always felt very, very tired. So I started taking this, uh, vitamin B12 supplement and, um, it got to a point where my, I have a functional medicine physician who would regularly every three or four months, take a look at my blood. And she came back and said, whoa, 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 you got to stop taking B12. You're like, your vitamin B12 levels are off the charts. You have to stop. And it ended up that, you know, my, my exhaustion was due to other things and, and it had nothing to do with vitamin B12. So it's very important, I think, that we understand exactly what's going on with each child um, before we add any kind of supplementation. There we go. But then to address her, how do I help my child to feed himself? Right. Now, feeding is a whole separate issue, and it's really important. I, I So feeding is ha, goes in multiple stages. There's a lot of uh, people, behaviorists, who are actually trained in feeding therapy. And it goes through stages, and it depends, again, on the child. So some children, for instance, are very limited in what they eat, either because they have obsessive types of, of behavior and therefore they will only eat certain foods that look a certain way, or a child might be very, very restricted to just crunchy foods or soft foods or salty foods or et cetera, et cetera. Or some children will, for instance, not be able to swallow foods. Others will have difficulty with chewing. It's very, very important to get a feeding specialist. A lot of BCBAs, as I said, are specializing in this. Speech pathologists also have the ability to be trained to be experts in feeding therapy. It's important to find someone first because you have to identify what your specific child's issue is. Some kids, uh, if, I'll give you some examples. So for example, if it's a matter of uh, you know, the child eats everything that's mushy. Well, is it a textural thing or is the child just has never learned how to chew? Um, and whichever one it is, we if it's a texture thing, we have to gradually expose them to harder foods. If it's a chewing issue, we have to teach them how to chew uh, different things. And so uh, it is a process. It's a very, very successful training that is done through ABA to teach children how to, you know, eat properly and to feed themselves. Um, but it is a step-by-step -step thing. And I don't, honestly, I mean, other than telling you one thing, I don't recommend parents try to do feeding on their own. The one thing that I will tell you is that the key to it all is allowing the child to eat something they really, really like if they're willing to eat a tiny amount of something they don't like. So let's say it's a child who will not eat vegetables or will not eat crunchy foods or whatever it is, just giving them a tiny morsel of that and then allowing them to eat a lot of other stuff that they do like, and then you gradually change that, increase the amount of the thing they don't like. I'm just looking at what Becky continued to wrote, write and she said, 
just sitting down to finish a meal. I cook his meals soft, which he likes, and he also likes to chew crunchy things. So that's good. So Becky, your issue is more about the duration of time that he's sitting. So what you do is you will find something that is very meaningful and reinforcing to him. Could be a food item. It could be just a, uh, you know, a small uh, two seconds of watching something, two minutes of watching something on an iPad. Could be a token system, could be whatever it is, something rewarding and basically intermittently give that to him during the course of sitting down. So if he's sitting and he's eating something, reward him and then he'll continue and make sure he knows that if you sit one more minute, set a timer, show him that every minute that you sit, you're gonna get a reward. And then I see she wrote, like he knows how to hold his spoon, but he'll not finish it, he will stand up. So what your issue is really more about teaching him to sit while eating. And that is that is what you need to reinforce. So you, you start with foods that he really likes and only allow him to have them when he is sitting and, you know, go and continuously reward him for maintaining that, the sitting down part. I have to ask this question because we, we used to run a program called The A Word and uh, we don't have it airing right now and that's a whole other, we, we can talk about that later. But one of the techniques that they used, he was a very small child, but um, feeding was a big issue. One of the, his big reinforcer was that he loved to watch kid videos like the ones that they would play on the Teletubbies. So they would put an iPad like this, a prop yeah. it up on the table. Yeah. And yep. if he was holding his spoon and regularly eating, the, they would have the iPad with the video playing. But if he stopped, they would stop the video. What right. do you think about that? And that's totally fine. And that's one of the things that Vicky can try. It is a phase. It's not forever because you might not want your child or he might not even have access to an iPad always, right? So you will start with the iPad being turned on the, for the length of time he's sitting and eating. But then over time, you might decide this isn't really appropriate. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually turn that into a token economy. So for instance, you could give him stickers and he needs five stickers before he can have his iPad. Or you can make it like over time what happens with ABA is that we increase the demand and reduce the reinforcer, which would be the iPad, right? You, there are so many other ways that you can also reinforce. For instance, just having a conversation about something he likes, or maybe just occasionally rewarding him with some object, like a, a small toy or something. But the whole concept is what you're trying to increase here is the duration of time sitting. It's not so much, it doesn't sound like it's so much the eating itself because he's able to do that. He's just not doing it sitting down for a long period of time. So that's what you want to increase. But I do want to reiterate that a lot, and people are writing in like Anna says, yes, I use the, to uh, the token board with the yeah. iPad while eating. But I think it's really, I remember on the A word, one of the things that just made me howl because I thought, oh my gosh, I am this dad is that when they, when they were explaining to him how they were going to do the intervention, the dad was like, that's not going to work. We've already tried that. But what's important is that you don't just give your child the iPad and have them sit and eat and, and then walk away from that. Um, that that's, that's not what the intervention is, that it's you yeah. just make a decision. Like uh, Dr. Grampiche said, how am I going to use it? Am I going to do tokens or is it going to be just while they're eating and I pause it, which means you have to stay there and watch. And the minute they stop eating, you pause it, but you just don't, because otherwise, then they get into the video and they stop eating anyway, and it ceases to be oh, effective. That's right. And now I see Becky writing in more. And this is why it's so important. It's awesome that you're here, Becky, and you're clarifying. So yes. I can keep narrowing in and giving you better advice. <laughs> so Becky wrote, he can wait for as long as he wants because he knows dad or I will feed him. And then she wrote, rather, he will go get a finger food instead of picking up a spoon to eat. Okay. This is really simple. You will now um, have him take one spoon of a food item and then you'll give him finger foods after that. You'll just put them in front of him and let him eat them. Then the next day you will require two spoons 
for the finger food that you're going to give them right after that. The next day, you're going to require three spoons, and you can make it very visually easy for him. You can literally put three spoons filled with food or tell him three spoons, and you're going to count one, two, three. Awesome, and here's your plate of finger food. And that way, you will eventually get him used to more and more. Do not feed him if he decides not to eat. I promise you, he will eat. Just make sure that he's not have ha, that he doesn't have access to the finger foods um, unless he does the spoon, and then you can give him access. There we go. She says, "Okay, that's definitely what I will start this I'm afternoon." Sure. I love it. We got there. I also want to give a shout out to um, Nicholas Neurodivergent Journey, who's watching us. I did his podcast last week, Dr. Grampiche, and he would like to ask you to do his podcast as well. So awesome. um, we'll see if we can work that out. Uh, I also want to point out that Parker on Facebook put the link to uh, copaa.org for those of you who are having issues with your IEPs. That's a great place to go if you're looking for an advocate or an attorney. Uh, again, that's www.copaa.org. Traven, if you have time, if you can put that up on Restream so that it also gets up on YouTube. But Parker, thank you for putting that on Facebook for us. We're saying hello to Nathan and Anna. Joanne says, Dr. Doreen, why is my son's school giving us such a hard time when we ask for an aide that has ABA training? Oh. Um, I think just jumped. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Let me go back. Um, so our son is 10 and in the fourth grade, he has had a one-on-one -on -one since kindergarten, no behavior problems, but I think he could do better if his support knew how to direct reward support more. Yeah, definitely. And you're absolutely right. And sometimes, you know, first of all, a lot of the aides from, I will just tell you, and I won't name the district, but I will tell you that we had years and years ago, a very large school district contracted with us to provide training for i think it was some very large number of aides like 1500 aides and i it just so happened that i knew uh, on a personal level a couple of the individuals who were aides at that district uh, they were actually parents of a ch of children who were friends with my children so that's how i knew them and I had a conversation with those people after we had provided the training and they very honestly told me, oh, we didn't pay attention at all. In fact, a lot of us didn't even attend. So training for AIDS, many of the AIDS that are hired by school districts aren't really trained. They might have some sort of credential that says they are trained, but a lot of them are not trained. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is even if they are trained, a lot of people in the field don't understand and realize exactly what you said, which is this child doesn't have challenging behaviors. What he needs is support. He needs someone in the classroom to reward him, to direct him to the teacher, to prompt him to continue to break down the topic for him so he's able to attend better. Uh, you know, all those things that are called an accommodation. So please don't let them, uh, you know, run in circles. Just keep insisting. And this is where it becomes important perhaps to get an advocate or a parent or, or an attorney even. But this is the stuff that needs to go into the IEP. And it's super important because, yes, you're right, Joanny, that your child will do better if they have an aide who's supporting them. Yes. But let's remember that it always comes down to money for them. And so I, I agree completely that it's important to um, lawyer up or advocate up uh, because sometimes if you do that, here, here is the bottom line. If you have an attorney advocate, then they have to bring an attorney with them to every single meeting. And that, the retainer to have that attorney come and sit there at the meeting starts to cost them more money than it would to provide the service yeah. that you're asking for. So don't be afraid to do it because sometimes that's when they know you mean business. I uh, will remember that you might not, the school might not have an employee who is capable of doing what you need them to do. And that's where 
the IDEA actually comes in because the Free and Appropriate Education Act says that if the school cannot provide you what you need, they have to contract with a private provider of ABA to provide that for you. And this is what's called related services, right? So they have to pay a provider to actually give you a really good aid. And that might be the way that you need to go. And I will say too, they're not going to put that the aid is ABA trained in the IEP. Um, I don't know anybody that's ever gotten that because it, uh, yeah. it doesn't cover methods um, right. in the IEP. But you can ask for a, 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 somebody to train them that's ABA based. You can ask for uh, a consultancy. What we used to ask for is that one of our favorite um, BTs would come in for the first two weeks of school that they would pay him just to come in the first two weeks of school to train the teacher and get the classroom running and get the aid trained. And that was gold. That two weeks yes. at the beginning of the year would set us up, but we never had ABA in our, in our IEP. Just wanted to say right. that. Um, right. But uh, Autism Journey with Elijah has written in and said, Dr. Doreen, I was waiting for an IEP meeting and no one communicated the next meeting with me until I got to the school grounds today for the graduation. They are denying the one-to-one -one aid and he doesn't qualify for ESY. It wasn't an official IEP meeting, but 10 people in a room just to tell me no oh. on both sides. What can I do now that he doesn't have a current IEP? School ends on Thursday. So disgusted and upset. Shannon, I would love to email you after. Thank you both. And we can yeah. absolutely talk after. But Do Dr. Doreen, what do you want to say? I mean, that's really upsetting. I can understand. I, there's got to be some, you know, and, and this is actually one of those things that a lot of schools do where they will just delay, delay, delay until you hit the summer. But I think that there's got to be some recourse, Shannon. Does Bonnie suggest anything when you just can't get the district to give you an IEP? I know for sure you got to put all this in writing, first of all. Yeah. But I'm not sure how you can try to get them to do it before the school ends. Well, I think it's they're not going to do much before the school ends, yeah. but they cannot spring IEP meetings on you the day of. Um, no. And I do think that it might be time to get an advocate to go in to yeah. show them that you mean business. And I and I do agree. Sarah has written in and said you need to call an emergency meeting. That's exactly what Bonnie would say that you need to ask yeah. for an emergency IEP meeting. Yeah. Um, and then get and then have your tape. I I suspect that part of the reason why they threw that at you today was because yeah. it didn't give you time to say that you wanted to record and they didn't want them saying no to you recorded because I'll bet they made a mistake. This, I mean, also, it's, they know that it's not legal for them to have an IEP without you. And I don't, that's why they probably said, this is not an official IEP. But yeah, ask for an emergency IEP and, and hopefully that will get you to move forward. But, you know, the bigger issue here is that they want to deny the aid and obviously they're also not giving you summer services which is extended school year services which is also not okay um, but if they have esy going on then that means that there's administration in place over the summer and so you can continue this battle yes but i do want to say as much as we can fight for esy i think that sometimes school shows you that they are not ready for your child and, yeah. and personally, I would rather see you get really good quality ABA this summer for him than take their crappy ESY when they don't want to provide him with an aid. Yeah. Um, this is, yeah, this is a child who's considered uh, his visual impairment too. It's unconscionable yeah. that they are treating you this way. Yeah. And sometimes, honestly, you know, ask for more. Ask for like ABA services to be paid for because that's going to be so much more expensive for them. Yeah that they will gladly back off and say, oh, no, okay, maybe we'll give you one of our own aids and a ESY or something. But, yep. you know, so go for it. Absolutely. And I'm happy to talk with you later on today. But I do think it might, for your sake, it might be time to pull in an advocate or an attorney because it's, it's so taxing for the parent when, that when they start to push. They're playing chicken with you and it yeah. doesn't feel good. And... Uh, it, it helps when you have somebody legally going in and saying, no, you're not going to get away with this. When they start to pull exactly. really BS moves. And this was a BS move today. Yeah. So yes. there we go. We're out of time, but I really want to thank Dr. Grampy Shea um, for being here. And we are going to have her next week live. 
I do want to say that on tomorrow's show, we're doing news and jargon of the day. And then we have Matt Asner and Nava Paskowitz Asner talking about their upcoming poker tournament and a new program that they have at, at their center, which I think will be really exciting for everybody to hear about. Um, so that's happening tomorrow. But Dr. Grampy Shea, thank you. We love you. Thank you so much, Shannon. It was awesome seeing you, and I will be back next week. Yes. And until then, you guys, uh, give your, kids a, uh, your kiddos a hug from me and one for you, too. Bye-bye for now. Bye, everyone. Don't forget, you can watch Ask Dr. Doreen live every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We hope to see you there.